Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are, we are now live uh, for our tax investigations webinar, our monthly series. And we do appreciate you all, you all choosing to join us. We will just give a, a few um, minutes, a um, minute or so, just to allow more people to, to log in. We can see people logging in right at the moment. So obviously we'll give a little bit of time for people to start um, joining us. And then I'll do formal introductions. Um, my, my name is Dave, Dave Jennings. I'm from Churchill Tax Advisors and I have three other co-presenters here today. I said we will give formal introductions once we start this um, presentation to, to you all. So do bear with us another 30, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and we'll just make sure everybody um, is here and logged in and watching. And then we will start with the introductions and then the, the, the presentation. So just be a, a minute and then we'll get going. <coughs> Extremely hot day today. Um, we're, all, we're all in our, without our ties, it's a bit, uh, Bit too hot. No, no work on here. Working from working from home. We could do with this thunderstorm coming to dampen things down a little bit, probably. So, just just briefly for those who um, are already here, you can type in your uh, your questions in in the box at the bottom I think without further ado um, let's let's start so if you, if you if you missed the the very 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 beginning of, of this um, session my name is Dave Jennings and I'm a tax director at Chartered uh, uh, Churchill Tax Advisors. I'm an ex HMRC Inspector of Taxes, spent some 20 years with uh, the Revenue and Customs and 14 years on this side of the fence working for um, large tax practices and, um, and, and around the country and have been with, with Churchill Tax since the beginning of, of 2020. So I have some 30 years experience on both sides of the fence dealing with every type of investigation you can think about from your, your local businesses through to your multinational firms, criminal tax prosecution, uh, defence and expert witness, and assisting clients through tax tribunal. My, my colleague here, uh, Phil Webb, is at um, Churchill Tax. I'll ask Phil briefly to introduce himself. Yeah, I'm. good afternoon. I've been with Churchill since uh, April 2019. Uh, before that, I've been uh, out of HMRC for 13 years working in various tax litigation firms and whilst I was in HMRC I was a tax investigator specialising in VAT and I worked in the solicitor's office as well uh, where I would take um, certain cases through to the tax tribunal and uh, present the cases. Um, well, um, now I'm here at Churchill, uh, one of the areas that I am specialising in, apart from dispute resolution, are the COP9 cases that uh, arise every now and again. We, we are going to be talking about kind of practice nine, and we have two guests today for this, this month's seminar. Very, very pleased to have Ned and Ali from Abbott Fielding and Edwin and Co joining us and they will talk about director duties and COVID-19, very topical and anybody who's a director of company uh, or anybody who's advising clients with directors of companies, they really need to listen to their talk today to understand what the risks are and, and how to protect them yourselves. So uh, would you two like to give yourself a quick intro now? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Ned Ali and uh, I'm, I'm a licensed insolvency practitioner. I've been working in insolvency for over 30 years now. Um, so unfortunately, I did work through the recession of the late 80s and the early 90s. Uh, I'm a director in the firm of Abbott Fielding and hopefully we'll give you a, a brief insight into what's going on right now in the economy and more importantly, what your duties are. Ali? 
Yeah, hi there. Um, so Ali Zaidi, I am a solicitor and partner in a firm called Edwin Co, uh, based in central London, uh, just around the corner from Churchill's, in fact. And um, I work with the team. I specialise in general commercial litigation, but insolvency in particular. So I do a lot of work advising directors who are the subject of investigation, whether by HMRC or whether it's by um, BIS for disqualification or whether it's by a liquidator after a company has failed. And as with Nadine, we're going to be talking about the topical issue of uh, directors, what to look out for, um, and how to make sure you, you uh, bounce back, see bills, etc. Excellent, thank you guys. Um, we just had one question from someone saying they, they can't hear any, anything. Could, could somebody, somebody in the audience just put a, a, an answer in the, in the question box just to say you can um, hear us please and that it is only one person who's maybe their speakers have got an issue. Um, can someone just confirm they can hear us? Good, yeah, I'm sure the people can confirm they can hear us. So maybe suggest you make sure your speakers are, um, are turned on or the connections um, good. So I will now share my screen, which will have the presentation. So this is, this is our presentation. Phil and I are going to talk about Code of Practice 9. What happens if um, you've committed tax fraud and what happens next? Just briefly, a quick reminder, because obviously it is um, the topic of, of the moment and is going to be covered in for the director's uh, duties requirement issues that Ned and Ali are going to do very shortly. We covered this in previous uh, seminars, but again, um, a reminder that HMRC are investigating and looking at incorrect claims for um, furlough payments, CG, CJRS, and the self-employed um, payments as well. Last time, we didn't know exactly when it was going to start because it needed royal assent. Royal assent occurred on the 22nd of July. That's given us certainty over when you can come forward voluntarily before um, HMRC could risk uh, prosecution or risk penalties up to 100% of the amount you received. The, the amount you received, if you obtained it incorrectly, is taxed at 100% in order to get it back in full, and then there's a penalty applied on top of that. If you've made an error or mistake, or even if you know a client or yourself know you've, you shouldn't have claimed it, it's still best to come forward first. I am acting for um, clients who, who have been um, uh, arrested for furlough fraud um, and have been investigated. So the revenue are coming down on this very, very heavy. So it, it definitely recommend to speak to an advisor or ourselves if you need assistance on making sure that anything is, is correct and you go through the right channels to disclose it to HMRC. You've got until the 20th of October, if you've received payments before the 22nd of July, Otherwise, you've got 90 days after the receipt of the payment to make a disclosure to HMRC that you made a mistake or you made a claim that you shouldn't have done and therefore you will not get the penalties. Um, otherwise, HMRC will charge these big penalties or a worse risk of prosecution. And talking about um, prosecution, that's what Code of Practice 9 is all about. In effect, tax prosecution. But Code of Practice 9 is a, is a format whereby the revenue will settle tax evasion, deliberate um, uh, fraud of, of, of taxes in a civil way. And we're going to cover what it means uh, and what happens. So Code of Practice 9, known as, as COP9, relates to the most serious type of investigation the revenue do that's not a criminal tax prosecution. Obviously, the worst one is tax evasion, cheating the public revenue, and that can be prosecuted, and you can end up with a fine or a prison sentence. And the, the revenue um, <coughs> prosecutes around about 1,500 
people per year for, for tax fraud and prosecution. So whether you call it fraud, evasion, deliberate behaviour, it's all the same terms, all the same as you. This is not careless behaviour, this is not a mistake, this is when fraud has been committed or the revenue allege it's been committed. The revenue can have a suspicion of fraud and that is sufficient for them to use the powers of Code of Practice 9. It does work, work both ways. We will also cover the situation where a client, um, an individual a taxpayer can request Code of Practice 9, the protection of Code of Practice 9 as well. The reason you would want the protection is because what Code of Practice means is you will have an immunity from prosecution providing you sign a contract to say you will cooperate with the revenue and you admit tax fraud. You do have to admit tax fraud in order to get into the Code of Practice 9 and to get the immunity from prosecution. There used to be, um, there used to be three, three options with Code of Practice 9. You could accept you'd committed fraud, you could deny you'd committed any fraud at all, or you could deny and cooperate. A few years ago, it's about five years ago now, the revenue scrapped the third option of deny but cooperate. The reason they did that is because too many people were selecting that option and saying, I've done nothing wrong deliberately, I hadn't committed tax fraud, but I will cooperate with you. That creates a bit of a problem for HMRC in running the investigations. They lose a bit of the power, um, it, they would rather deal with those cases where there's no fraud outside of Code of Practice 9. Or if someone is attempting to deny fraud, they will use the full investigation powers that are within their, uh, their possession. In order to get the immunity, you do have to make a full disclosure and full cooperation. As I mentioned, the other option uh, is to deny it. Obviously, you're not going to go to the revenue and request a Code of Practice 9 if you've nothing to declare. You're only going to get the immunity from prosecution if you hold your hand up and admit I have committed tax fraud. Then the revenue will give you an immunity from prosecution if you fall within the Code of Practice 9. So you're not going to volunteer and then deny it. It's not appropriate for voluntary disclosures. There are other routes to make voluntary disclosures where you're not admitting fraud and at worst maybe you're at, 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 accepting careless behaviour um, or maybe a, just a, a genuine mistake. However, if the revenue open a Code of Practice 9 investigation, it's the most serious type of investigation the revenue can do, if they've started it, that means it's prompted. If it's prompted, that increases the, the tax penalties and we'll cover those briefly at the end. This very, very strict time limits, and we will cover this a number of times um, this afternoon, of 60 days to reply. Within that 60 days, you have to submit your outline disclosure, which is not a full report, it's just a headline of what has happened. It does have to be complete. It's very serious if you miss anything off. It can include careless errors or mistakes within the report. If you're denying it, obviously you may still want to cooperate with the revenue and they will consider whether they will go down that route or not. If you deny, fraud completely then the revenue if their case is strong enough they will consider criminal prosecution again because there's no immunity from criminal prosecution if you don't admit tax fraud but obviously if you're not committed for it you're not going to, to, to say you have so our advice is certainly don't admit something you've not done but take very careful consideration about denying absolutely everything maybe something that you might be able to admit in order to get the immunity from prosecution. So if you deny the revenue, then do the full investigation themselves with all their powers behind them um, and obviously penalties are included. Still, now we'll go into a bit more detail about prompted and unprompted. Thanks. Um, the Code of Practice 9 is the last chance to avoid the criminal prosecution and it, it stops HMRC initiating their own investigation which of course would be done as, as Dave has said on a criminal basis and um, they will go into all kinds of areas and there's always a danger if that happens especially if 
you've done something wrong, but you've not done what they think you've done wrong, is that they can misunderstand the context in which certain things have happened. So if you've done something wrong and you've had a prompted uh, code of practice nine, then I think it's very important that you accept that you're going to admit the fraud. Um, and what you're doing is, is that once they offer you the opportunity um, to go into the COP9, you are being given an opportunity to cooperate um, and that you can then make, extent, make clear the extent of any of the fraudulent behaviour that you've been involved in. And it will also um, help identify any non-deliberate errors. Something may have occurred in a tax return uh, or a VAT return that was just that was an inadvertent error and that you may not have even been aware of until you look more closely, at which point those sort of things can be brought out. And that would be important for the value in terms of calculation of penalty later. Now, the outline disclosure is a document that allows the taxpayer the chance to make a clean breast of everything. Um, that they have done wrong and that the areas that they've done it in and also they HMRC will expect if the, the fraud has been a complicated one that the method is explained as well to a certain extent because in, in not too much detail in an outline disclosure you're effectively saying yes I've done something wrong it's in these areas um, but this at this stage in an outline disclosure, it's very important that we're not disclosing how much money has been um, gone missing from the Treasury um, and that we are not, um, we're going to say to HMRC, we're not sure of the total amount at this time, but we're going to work with our advisors. If you're with a virtual tax, it would be with us and we will reach uh, an idea of what the quantum is in the final report. Um, the outline disclosure, it must be remembered, is the taxpayers offer to HMRC that they will be candid in uh, outlining and disclosing their affairs. If HMRC accept this, then they will offer the COP9 as the method of pro as the method to progress matters. They will then leave it um, to the taxpayer and their advisors to find the quantum and dis um, describe, if need be, how the evasion of the tax was conducted and its scope. Um, if we accept all of that, then we progress. Unprompted disclosure um, is a slightly different thing because that means that if you are aware that you have conducted your tax affairs in a way that could attract the attention of HMRC and you want to relieve the stress and worry that you know there is a problem, that you've done something wrong, then you can contact HMRC and ask to disclose a tax fraud to them. And that you can ask to do so under the protection that Code of Practice 9 gives, which will be the big one, immunity from prosecution. HMRC will then review the request and if they're if it they're completely happy that um they you they think you're going to fall within the uh, code of practice nine protocols then they will send out code of nine forms to you you will be given the opportunity to fill them out again and this is very important you've got 60 days uh to complete the outline disclosure and it should be added that the 60 days deadline for Code of Practice 9 is not a deadline that can be extended um, because of some problem you've had or um, there can be extensions, but they are very, very rare and they have to be for very, very 
profound reasons that have affected your life. Otherwise, HMRC are clear that they want 60 days, they'll give you 60 days to find an advisor and prepare um, an outline disclosure and that the, and the, the outline disclosure as the slide says must be a full and frank summary of all that are the tax that have been lost either deliberately or via non-deliberate uh, uh, errors hopefully hmrc then accept the outline and they will offer cop 9 or the code of practice 9 and then we will progress to the next stage which as you can see as the slide has come up is the middle now the middle is all about um being able to work out the amount of tax that's been lost how it's been lost and that the middle will then look at virtually every area of your economic activity up to if it's appropriate the last 20 years um, one of the things you will do as part of your corporation hmrc will expect that they will want a payment on account made this will also have to be an amount that goes some way to matching the tax that they believe has been evaded and they see a, a payment on account as a sign of good faith and it is a very large tick in terms of a taxpayer's cooperation. Um, an opening meeting will allow HMRC to test the extent of uh, the subject's cooperation and they may ask questions about particular areas. When they do things like that, that does give the advisor a chance to see where HMRC are coming from, what information they have and the extent of the information. Um, at that meeting if they're happy they will also we will also set, um, come to an agreement whereby we will write a report setting out what we intend to do to disclose the, full, the tax losses and how they arose this will be an in-depth report and it will as i say cover all 20 years of the economic activity and it will be to look at many elements of a person's um, life, I think is probably the best way to describe it. You're looking at their banking, their, their earnings, their expenditures. It will involve to a degree a lifestyle check. HMRC will be interested, on how, interested in how you can afford different things. They will uh, require statements of assets and liabilities. Um, and then they will probably have questions about uh, the these sort of uh, these issues that arise. Then, if we go on, uh, they will also want um, a scoping meeting to have the full extent of what we are going to be uh, presenting to them in the report. Um, the middle part two is where you're hopefully tying everything up, bringing things to an end. HMRC are happy. We will disclose everything in the report within a set deadline. Um, and everything that will go into the report will be everything that's appropriate and um, relevant to any fraud that has been committed. There will be progress meetings, and it's during these progress meetings that things like the statements of assets and liabilities will be discussed. Um, and, but these can also be useful for um, the subject of a COP9 because sometimes HMRC will say, well, you need to get information from here. You need to get information from here. And especially when it comes to um, bank accounts that have been closed, etc., some banks don't cooperate. And it's, easy, and it's much e easier if HMRC agreed to make third party requests uh, to get that sort of information. Once in HMRC get the report, they will then review it and they will either accept it in wholly they may challenge part of it. It would be very disappointing if they were to challenge all of it. Um, and if they were to do that, then you would suspect that they didn't think they'd had full cooperation. So the reports, everything relies on the report. That's where everything is brought together. 
if there were any cha HMRC challenges, we would respond to them and try to get an agreement or maybe explain to them that what they were expecting, why it hasn't happened. And that again, and this comes back to what I said earlier, COP9 is about giving somebody the chance to explain the context of what had happened, which may, and that context, context may be very different from what may, things may how things may look on uh, paper. And then we would move on to the next stage whereby everything is brought to a conclusion. Thank you, Phil. So there is a beginning, um, a middle and, and an end to a, to a cut mine investigation. The, the beginning obviously is setting out the issues. The middle is completing the report or responding to HMRP's investigation if, um, if there's a, a complete denial. Ultimately, however it works through, it has to be concluded. That conclusion is going to be by way of penalty negotiations and an ultimate settlement contract with HMRC. Those, those penalties can, can be quite, quite severe. So if the revenue have opened the investigation, the penalties are going to be a minimum of 35% um, up to 70%, up to providing there's been nothing concealed. If something's been concealed, i.e. Um, documents have been faked, um, or, or you, the bank accounts have not been disclosed to, to the revenue or things have been hidden, then the penalties can start at 50% and go up to 100% of the tax liability. The advantage of approaching the revenue first is that the minimum penalty drops from 35% down to 20%. So there is still a penalty <laughs> of getting away with a penalty generally if you've committed tax fraud. Um, it's a civil settlement instead of it being criminal, but there is obviously a financial penalty and the minimum is 20% if you approach the revenue first. Within the context of the report though, there may be a mixture. So some liability, some tax duties might be charged at 35 or above, some might be at 20 and above. There could be a mixture across, across the board. But the other thing to watch out for is, is what's known as naming and shaming, which is the deliberate defaulters penalties. So if the tax settlement is £25,000 of, of tax, so that's not the penalty or interest, that's just the tax owing. If there's £25,000 of tax, that's been as a result of deliberate behaviour and you don't get a full 100% reduction in the, the penalty range. So that the mitigation covers helping, giving, telling the revenue. So it's, it's cooperating with the revenue. It's giving the information, it's supplying the report, it's making payments when, when they may be due or agreeing um, instalments. If you get the full mitigation, then there's no naming, shaming. If, however, you don't, there is a risk the revenue will publicise the name of the business or the individual and a press release is issued every quarter which does sometimes get picked up by the press so that is another area that makes it a serious issue in order to get um, the right advice to mitigate the penalties as much as possible. Deliberate defaulters are also reviewed very very closely for the next few years with every return they, they send in. So it's, overall it's a very serious type of investigation or a very handy voluntary disclosure in order to get an immunity from prosecution. So to summarise, Phil and myself have expressed, I think it's come across very clearly that this is you know, an extremely serious investigation if you're on the receiving end of the Code of Practice 9. It's an extremely useful procedure if you want to make a voluntary disclosure. You've got very strict 60 day deadlines to respond to the opening letter and you do have a constant risk of prosecution if you don't cooperate with the revenue during the period of the investigation. But the, the good thing is that you can get a total immunity from prosecution if they, either you come forward with a voluntary disclosure or obviously um, you're part of the, the procedure and the revenue grant that immunity in accordance with you cooperating. So that's my contract details, Steve Jennings at Church of Tax Advisors. Um, give, give the office a ring if you need help and assistance. P.web at Church of Tax Advisors is Phil's email. And again, give the office um, a call if you want to speak to, to Phil.
We will cover questions at the end of the session once uh, Ali and Ned have done their presentation too. So thank you for all the questions that are coming in at the moment. I will now go back to the um, general position. There we go. And allow your slides to be there. So um, all yours, um, Ned and Ali. Uh, thanks, Dave. Excellent. Okay. Right, I'm going to kick off. So uh, again, just to recap. So my name is Ali Zaidi. I am solicitor and partner in Edwin Co. We are both partner practice in Hoban. Um, and I head up and specialise in insolvency in particular. Um, I do a lot of work acting for insolvency practitioners um, and similarly do a lot of work defending directors being investigated. So I see it from both sides. So I know what insolvency practitioners are looking for. Uh, when they're investigating directors um, and similarly I know what HMRC are looking for uh, when they're conducting such investigations and as David David has touched on this is going to be the next few months are going to be an interesting time where HMRC are really going to be upping um, their investigations into what has been taking place with the bounce back and C bills and just to put this into context um, We've seen all the publicity, there's lots of figures being banded around, but you know, the furlough scheme, for example, is estimated to be costing a minimum of 40 billion. The amounts that have been taken out by C bills and bounce back is the equivalent of 123 billion. I mean, that's 13% of GDP. And when you just think about those kind of figures, um, it's no surprise that HMRC in particular are going to be very interested in making sure that these schemes have not been abused by directors or their advisors. And, and the critical thing is this, it's a point made by The Economist that the purpose of these schemes is about preserving the businesses, or if you like, to hold the ring until companies manage to trade their way through the pandemic. So what these loans are not meant to do is to be used by directors for paying off preferential creditors or for expansion plans, or worst of all, it's certainly not intended to remunerate the directors, whether it's dividends or bonuses. So just a quick overview. The way this talk works is so I, I'm going to give an overview of the legal position. Uh, I'll try and condense it and keep it as simple as possible. Um, and then Nadim um, will talk after me about some practical issues that arise when he's giving advice to directors. So um, a quick recap, um, Companies Act imposes duties upon a director. I've listed out the main ones there, all fairly straightforward and fairly obvious, promoting the success of the company, exercising independent judgment, um, avoid conflicts of interest, declare interest in transactions, et cetera, et cetera. The one I skipped is the key one, which is section 174 which is the duty to exercise reasonable skill, care and diligence. And the reason I left that to last is because that is the most important section of the Companies Act, because it's actually repeated in the Insolvency Act. So the thing about directors' duties are, yes, they're set out in the Companies Act, but there are additional duties set out in the Insolvency Act there are also some further duties that are set out in case law. And there's one particular case that I'm going to come on to in a moment. But just going back to the Insolvency Act. So Section 212 of the Insolvency Act is effectively a mirror provision of Section 174 of the Companies Act. But basically, what's 212 allow the liquidator to do is once a company is in liquidation, the liquidator stands in the shoes of the company and says, right, I, as a company, am entitled to examine the conduct of a director and I'm entitled to decide whether I think you have acted in a way which breached your duty to the company or is misfeasance, whatever you want to call it. And therefore, on behalf of the company, I, the liquidator, am entitled to demand you, the director, must repay money owed. And this is particularly important because a lot of the conversations that Dean and I have been having to accountants and directors have been along the lines of, well, you know, bounce back. It's easy money, right? I mean, who's going to monitor it? 
C bills, uh, there's no checks, it's all fine. And HMRC don't have the resources anyway to investigate. Well, I'm sure Dave and Phil will have a very different view on that, but the point is this, even if that were true and HMRC doesn't have the resources, if the company takes out a bounce back loan, takes out a C bill loan and abuses it, and the company then goes into insolvency, a liquidator is entitled under Section 212 to turn around to the director and say, well, forget about HMRC, I as liquidator, I'm entitled to recover these money. So moving on, I'm not going to go through all of these slides, but another very important provision in the Insolvency Act is what's called wrongful trading. And again, this is going to become a very popular theme over the next 12 months. So what wrongful trading provides is for a situation for a liquidator to claim money back from a director on the basis of saying to the director, look, you knew a company was insolvent when you took out the bounce back loan or C bill loan. You knew or ought to have known that there was no prospect of you ever repaying those monies, yet you continue trading. The deficit, i.e. the monies owed to creditors, just got worse and worse and worse. Therefore, you, the director, you are obliged to repay the increase in the deficit. So, for example, simple terms, if a company is in, insolvent to the sum of half a million pounds, um, at the time it takes out the bounce back loan, six months later it goes into insolvency, by which time the deficit has ballooned to a million, then the director is personally liable for that half a million pound increase. Section 423, I'll, I'll skip that for the time being because time is short. But what I do want to talk about is, if you remember previously, I was explaining there are duties set out in the Companies Act. There are duties set out in the Insolvency Act. Now, how is a director to be judged? What the Companies Act says is that basically it's a subjective test. So you judge the director based on his own knowledge and whether he honestly believed that what he did was in the best interest of the company. And this is quite important because um, in my experience, quite often when a liquidator or HMRC is writing to a director and attacking them for what they have done, it's normally on the basis of, well, look, you know, a, a sensible, honest, reasonable director would never have done those things. And with the benefit of hindsight, clearly what you did was wrong. That's all nonsense. What the Companies Act says is it's a subjective test. It's based on what the director himself knew at the time. However, there are three exceptions to that. And one exception is very important, which is the one I want to talk about, which is what happens when um, a company is potentially insolvent? Now, you can quite often have a situation where, you know, on the balance sheet, the company looks as if it's in a deficit or the company may have cash flow problems, so it may be asset rich, but cash poor, it's struggling to pay its creditors. Up until last year, the legal position was that if a company was deemed to be insolvent, even on the balance sheet basis or cash flow basis, then consequently, the duty of the director shifts. The duty is no longer to act in the best interest of the company, i.e. shareholders, but actually the duty is to the company's creditors. But that all changed last year because the test was then further expanded because last year we saw a case called Sequana. And what Sequana is all about is what happens where a company is considered to likely be insolvent. So isn't insolvent, but could or is likely to be insolvent. And in that situation, what the court has ruled in the case of Sequana is that the directors owe a duty to act in the best interest of the creditors. And in that particular case, just to give you an example, so Sequana was a company which on its balance sheet looked insolvent. However, it had amassed a quite substantial cash sum of about 50 million pounds. And it had two choices. Either it uses the 50 million to pay off its creditors, or it uses the 50 million to pay a dividend to its shareholders. The directors decided on the latter, so they pay the money up, put the company into liquidation, and the liquidator then turns around and says, but hang on a minute, when you paid that dividend, you were potentially insolvent. 
Therefore, we expect you, the directors, to now repay that dividend back to the company. Unsurprisingly, the court, well, the court did agree with the liquidator, and unsurprisingly, the directors unfortunately couldn't find £50 million between them to reimburse the company. But it's the important point that in the current climate, if you think about the reasons why do companies need bounce back loans, why do they need C bills, the mere fact that a company is looking at that tends to suggest that they may actually be insolvent. So you as a director or you as an accountant advising directors, what you need to be very careful about is when you take that money, that's fine, but please bear in mind, what are you using it for? Everything you do with that money has to be for the benefit of the company's creditors. So on a practical level, where that takes us, and I'm just going to skip a few slides, is if you're a director and you've taken advantage of these loans, or you're an accountant and you're advising the directors on whether they should be taking these loans, or they have taken these loans and there's now a question mark as to how to apply those monies, you have to be very careful now about how you apply those monies. You know, it's, it's a balancing act between, on the one hand, like I said, the purpose of these loans is to preserve the company's business. The purpose is not to simply ignore HMRC, ignore your employees, ignore your landlord, and just simply pay off those creditors who shout the loudest or those creditors who are effectively key suppliers. And certainly what these loans are not about is to remunerate the directors by way of dividends, salary, bonuses, however you want to dress it up. Because in those scenarios, that's where HMRC are going to come after you. That's where people like Nadim are going to come after you if you try to liquidate of your company. So without further ado, I've sort of rushed through the overview, um, but I'm conscious that time is short. So Nadim, over to you to talk about some of the practical things that directors and accountants need to be looking at in this scenario. Thank you very much, Ali. Hello, everyone, again. Um, again, I'm conscious of the time, so I will literally zoom through this. What I wanted to talk about today was just not just the insolvency side, but predominantly about these government loans and where we go from there. I've recently been advising a big government charity with tens of millions of pounds of assets, and I had to explain to them, look, there is no manual for this. We are living in unprecedented times. We are literally making up things as we go along. The Insolvency Act has been changed by order of parliament in the last few months as the government brings in emergency laws to try and cope with what is going on. So what something might be legal today might not necessarily be legal in three months, six months, nine months, or a year down the line. Also, it's quite important to think about where we are today and where you might be sitting in two years time in the cold light of day in a courtroom. So first, a couple of major points. The inland revenue have been instructed right now, and this came directly from the insolvency division, that they should be looking sympathetically at any company in trouble. What does that mean? It means for the first time that they will not automatically presume that if people are defaulting, they are out to intentionally defraud them. What that presume it means that they will give directors the opportunity to come to arrangements and to be fair to the HMRC at the present moment they are trying to reach out to do that what it doesn't mean though is that directors can take advantage of historic debt to kind of bury it and this is a very important point that HMRC have said to me they will be looking at people's compliance history if you are a company that has always paid your VAT and your PAYE on time, and paid your corporation tax and never had a problem, and you suddenly get into financial difficulties because of what's going on, they will be sympathetic. If you are someone who has historically been late in paying HMRC week in, week out, and suddenly come along and say, well, do you know what? I can't pay you again this month. They're gonna be less sympathetic towards you. That's the first criteria. The second criteria, and it was quite interesting, is that HMRC have been making a note of every company that's taken advantage of any government aid package, whether it is rates rebates, whether it is furlough, whether it is bounce back loans. And in the event that these companies do go into any form of insolvency procedure, 
they will be asking the insolvency practitioner to look specifically at what happened to those eight packages. And that's quite an important point because I've had accountants ring me up to point out that their clients have, for example, and this is an actual case, use £50,000 to buy three Rolexes and stick it under the pillow. Or in other cases, accountants have pointed out their clients have taken advantage of £50,000 and sent it abroad. They didn't quite need the money, but they've done it. So you can take that money as long as you pay it back. But if you don't pay it back, what is going to happen? Well, the answer is that an insolvency practitioner is going to have to come after you. And it's not a question of, well, they might do the Nelson touch and ignore it. They're going to have no choice in this. HMRC are making this very clear to us that if insolvency practitioners do not pursue these actions where there is an action to be pursued, they will be replacing them with an insolvency practitioner that will pursue. And that's a quite an important point because there are certain insolvency practitioners out there that, for want of a better word, are very much pro HMRC. They do a lot of work for HMRC, they're on their panels. And they are very aggressive and they will be coming at them. And as Ali was saying on the Sequana case, the Sequana case is a very important case because it gives a whole new arsenal to insolvency practitioners to pursue individuals. So that's the first problem. Now, where does this take us? Well, like I said, we are in unprecedented times. There is no manual for this at the present moment. You know, I started back in the late 80s when we went through that terrible recession all the way into the early 90s. I have a feeling what we are about to experience right now is going to be at the very least as bad as that and potentially worse. So the government has a very strict tightrope to walk, and that is between scaring people off from starting businesses by just being too draconian, whilst at the same time not allowing people to abuse the system. And I think that where we're going to start with is that they will be looking at those easy wins, the low-hanging fruit, but they have to balance that up with the public purse. And we can't lose sight of this. You know, right now, economists are, talk, are using the word generational debt. That's what they're saying. The debt that we are accruing, and it's certainly going to exceed the one trillion pound mark. But if we have a second lockdown, you could be looking at two trillion. Someone somewhere has to make up that debt. They have to recover that money. And how do they recover that money? Well, of course, they recover it from the taxpayers. That's us. So... The easy low-hanging fruit is going to be the insolvency procedures for people that took advantage of government schemes. I have said to accountants, if your client does not need that money right now, desperately do not take it. I know it's tempting to take it and it's £50,000 or whatever in your bank account the next day, but it comes with some very serious strings. And part of the reason is not so much where we are today, it's where we're going to be in six months' time. Whilst working with this charity, part of our division was within the NHS. And the NHS, as far early as June of this year, had modelled a second outbreak in October. Now, what does that mean? Well, the honest answer is no one has a clue yet. But what I can tell you, talking to economists, is that there is now a growing feeling that, firstly, there won't be a universal lockdown again. There might be regional lockdowns or local lockdowns, but there's not going to be a universal. But the second thing that they're saying is that there is unlikely to be the same level of state aid package as we saw in March and April of this year. There might be some government help. There is talk of the government matching you pound for pound, but there's no guarantee. So what does that mean? Well, you know what, we could end up with another lockdown, say in the Southeast, and it might be a couple of weeks, it might be a month, it might be six weeks, but in that period, there may not be no government help, or the government may go back to some sort of universal credit level of support for employees, but nothing like the levels that we saw in the past. So we are expecting that insolvency levels are going to rise dramatically. And this is where the problem arises for a number of people, because in amongst all of this, we are also anticipating a number of what they refer to as marquee insolvencies. These are the big companies that go down the carillions of this world, that when they go insolvent, they will take down another 10, 100,000 companies with them, and we've seen it in the past. So what you might do is you get a situation where you have a client or you're an individual who is solvent today. You've taken the bounce back loan. You've used it to pay yourself dividends, salary. You think, fantastic, I'm owed a million pounds by a third-party company. And suddenly that company goes bust tomorrow. Now, at that stage, where does your defense lie? And your first port of defense lies in your compliance history. I cannot stress that enough. That is the first sorting point that HMRC are going to be looking at. If you've been up to date, if you've played by the rules, you will be looked at last in the queue. 
if your compliance history is poor, you'll be the first person that they will be looking at. And then they will be expecting to repayment of whatever money that you have taken. So things like the bounce back on the sea bills and potentially even the rates rebate. Um, there have been situations where local authorities have rebated very much many people in the kind of public in sector. Not all that money's been used for business. I know that because I've had accountants who rang me up and they said, Ned, my client has taken this, he's taken that, whatever. Should he be taking it? My advice to him is that you need to be careful. If you're going to be able to trade solvently, it's not a problem. You can, go, you can do whatever you want with the money. But if you ever run a risk of becoming insolvent, then the risk is going to come back onto you. So what can you do to protect yourself? These are the important points. The first thing, and I cannot stress this enough, is file notes within the company's books and records. Why did you make that decision? So if you're a solvent company today, why did you make a decision to go and take a £50,000 loan? Well, you might have made that decision because you could anticipate there was going to be trouble ahead. You might have made that decision because you anticipated that one of your suppliers or customers had gone into liquidation and you needed money down the line. Making those notes and sticking them in the minute book is always the first line of defense. It's very difficult, and that's why I said my point to start. Where are you going to be in two years' time if you're sitting in the court in the cold light of day and all this is behind us? A judge is not going to be able to put a decision if you don't have the evidence to show him what your thinking was at the time, why you made that decision. And sometimes it's very important to go to your professional advisors, to go to your accountants, your lawyers, and say, this is what I think the situation is. I want to do this. What do you think? And get an opinion from them. I've provided probably about a dozen opinions over the last two months, some of them in favor of the company, some of them against the company. Um, but something that they could stick in that minute book that if things went wrong a few months down the line, they're able to point to that as their first line of defense. Now, that's not a guaranteed defense because right now there is no certainty and the insolvency law is changing so quickly. And I envisage that we're going to see a lot more changes over the next two, three years as things start to unravel. But it is the best basis of a defense. Um, I am conscious of time and, and I know that people might have some questions. So I think it's a good place to wrap it up. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Ned and Ali. That's uh, an extremely useful talk um, this, this afternoon. Some very important points then for people to take away. Um, obviously, we are limited in time for questions. What I would suggest if we can't get through all, all the questions in the time we have, that you contact ourselves. If you have queries about tax investigations, you give Ali and Ned um, a call if um, if you've got questions for them, um, let's let's have a look um, if you've if we've got some questions here that we can we can cover. We've got some questions around um, code, code of Practice 9. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that someone is, is this is quite a common question that, that we do get on Code of Practice 9, and that is, um, do I have to disclose uh, my personal bank account? Um, do, do, you, uh, do you have an answer to that one, Phil? Uh, yes, I'm afraid you are going to have to disclose your personal bank account. Um, HMRC want to have a picture of your entire economic activity and they'll want to be seeing what goes into in and out of your personal bank account as well as your business bank accounts. Yeah, it is, it is pretty, especially with coming to practice now. Well, the revenue can't do, um, they can't just ask up front, you know, as soon as they start an investigation, say, give us your private bank account. Uh, you know, they, they can't do that um, at, at the very start of an investigation. They have to give a reason, it has to be a link to the business. Um, but in Code Practice 9, it's slightly different because um, generally all records are, are within the sphere of the Code of Practice um, 9. Well, and, uh, I suppose a, um, a, a question uh, around Code, code 9 um, as, as well is, is to do with 
um, the the issue of of denying um, any any um, any fraud or deliberate tax behaviour. And then the the question there, obviously, the, the question is, what you know, is, what's the risk to me of doing that? It's a bit scary to have the protection, the immunity from prosecution protection. And that's quite right. So if you deny the allegation that the revenue making, and it is an allegation, it's a suspicion from the revenue. If they open a, a cop nine, they suspect fraud has taken place. Tax fraud has happened. They may have direct information from third parties. They may just have a hunch. There may be that someone has sent in um, some some evidence against the particular taxpayer, some disgruntled uh, family member, or someone they've they've wronged in the past might want to um, have a, have a go about them. But usually, the revenue compiler um, a document first, so it's not just any one thing. They have quite strong ground for for suspecting fraud. But we do have cases where the revenue are wrong. Either the information was incorrect um, or the, the alleged tax fraud isn't deliberate behaviour. It has been careless at worst. So a denial is the best route if that's the genuine situation. We would never advise someone to admit fraud if you've not committed fraud. If you have committed fraud, yes, we would advise committing fraud. But if you deny, He's quite right. You don't have the protection of immunity from prosecution. But um, I suppose you can never guarantee the situation, but you'd hope that if the revenue were going to prosecute you, if they had sufficient evidence to prosecute, they would have prosecuted. They would have, you would have had a dawn raid, knock on the door, the police and the revenue, 20 people would turn up with search warrants and they would take computers and relevant documents away. If they haven't done that and they've issued a COP9, the chances are at that stage they're still building up a report. So if you deny it, you would hope there isn't going to be a prosecution, but you absolutely need to cooperate with the revenue in order to mitigate penalties if there is a tax liability at the end of it. We've, we've had a, um, a question with regard to um, this is this is something we touched on in the previous seminar really but it's, i suppose it's relevant to, to investigations generally is is what happens if um the revenue offer a review um, an independent or internal review of a decision or assessments or closure notices what what's the chance of winning the the, the case um, that will obviously depend on, a, on, on each individual situation. Often with internal reviews, the revenue don't usually... I think Dave may have had some connectivity problems or the 50p ran out. <laughs> Sorry, my connection. It is the situation is that obviously it's uh, it's 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 the revenue doing doing the uh, doing the review. So they're reviewing a colleague's work. What is the chance of overturning that? It's it's possible. It is possible. Um, it very much depends on the uh, if the revenue made a mistake or if the uh, fresh fair advisor that changes it. But quite often. Unfortunately, it's not always um, a change of view. What it does do is crystallise the position. So if there was any doubt over what the revenue we're trying to, to go for, I, I guess we, we have some certainty around that and we can then try and go down a different route of alternative dispute resolution or obviously go to the tax tribunal or if there's a, if there's a potential complaint situation or even still open, you know, continue dialogue with HMRC if there's a, a further evidence or further information that hasn't been considered, then there are still routes um, to go. Did, um, did I, I've lost all questions because I was disconnected. I've lost all questions. Was there anything else, Ali and Ned, you wanted to, to add um, from, from following up from your um, talk? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, it, as I say, it's a very fluid situation at the present moment. 
or contact details are on there, we don't mind answering questions directly afterwards if someone has a simple question or even if someone needs advice on the way to go forward. We're always happy to help. Yes, brilliant. Thank you. And, and um, Ali, sorry, I'm not sure. If, yeah, you're on mute. No, no, I was just, just going to. Ali, your microphone's on mute. Sorry, just, yes, yeah, say, say again. I, I think you may have muted it again, <laughs> Ali. <laughs> Try again. Right, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Yes, yes. All right, okay. Uh, it was only to reiterate what Nadim said. It, it is a very fluid situation, but you know, the the risk to directors is complacency. The risk to accountants is not being able to see the opportunities. Um, well, two things actually. It's the opportunity for accountants actually to uh, protect their clients by advising them properly, but also to actually generate work from it in terms of being able to give proper advice. You know, the sort of things I would expect an accountant to be doing are cash flow forecasts, um, preparing minutes, explaining what these money must be used for. So there's there's opportunity about that for accountants. Um, but as we said, you know, um, our contact details are there. We're more than happy to uh, do with any inquiries or anybody wants to contact us. Fantastic. Thank you. And if anyone's <laughs> lost those contacts, do, do uh, approach us at Churchill and we can put you in touch with Ali or, 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 or Ned. Absolutely. Uh, We've, we've just yeah, got a question that's come in. Oh, go on. Sorry, just, well, just one thing. This is actually something that HMRC said to me. HMRC have been instructed to be sympathetic at the present moment. So even if you can't pay, send in those returns in so they can make a record of it. We'll look, be looked on far more favorably than simply not sending the returns in. I know it's a crazy situation, but they have got their instructions at the present moment to be sympathetic to genuine companies that are experiencing difficulty. And my advice right now would be, you'll be looked on far more favourable if you send the returns in than if you just simply decide not to send them in. Yes, no, very good point. And, and same, you know, on the investigation side, cooperation and coming forward to the revenue is is better than it being dragged, kicking and screaming from 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 a client, which is always always worse. But a quick quick question before we close down, someone, and it's a good question. Someone's asked that uh, one of their clients got the fifty k bounce back loan um, was taken out against the dormant company. They intend to trade, but trade hasn't started yet. What is used does that um, um, create? Let, let me explain a couple of things. First, the purpose is the, 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 the devil's in the detail, and it says bounce back loan. You know? So it's for future mm -hmm. trading. Now, if this dormant company is going to carry on trading, and they repay the 50,000, no one's going to question it. But if they do become insolvent, then questions will be asked how a dormant company suddenly got access to 50,000 pounds when it never traded. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very odd. I have, I have heard all sorts of rumors, you know, around of what people have been using um, bounce back loans for and, and like you say if, if you if you repay it quickly then maybe no questions are asked that, that you're going to have real problems if you don't repay it yeah absolutely brilliant thank you very much um sorry we haven't got time for any more questions we've gone over the time by five minutes um just just if we wrap again thank you everyone for attending and um you will get copies of this recording um, email through to you within the next um, two, two, three days, I think it goes through. And thank you, Ali and Ned, for joining Phil and I at today's thank you. webinar. And we look forward to seeing everybody else next month. There's a tax advisory one in two weeks' time and, and an investigation one in a month. So keep your eyes peeled for the newsletter. Uh, so we'll say goodbye again. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Goodbye.